fun. All right. Well, how's everyone doing this? I almost said this morning, tonight. How's everyone doing? Good? Good, good. Well, why don't you um, open up your Bibles? We're going to start. Um, actually, I want to do this first. I was going to. Let me do this first. How many of you have just been blessed by this series, God Loves You? Really, really good. So I just want to encourage you, if you um, have missed Sundays, catch up by listening. Um, it's just been such rich word. And um, I told Pastor Nate on Sunday, I said, I really feel like this is just, um, we may be here a while <laughs> on this topic. Because, uh, and he said, yeah. And because it's something we have to, I just feel like it, we got to grab it like more than we've ever grabbed it before. It's so vital and so key, especially um, for the day we're living in. And um, anyways, so I encourage you, even if you were here on Sunday, go back and listen again, because um, the word is just rich, and he's getting stuff to us, amen? And it's good, and um, just not taking for granted the word that comes, and you know, like Landon said, it's so important not to just be a hearer, but a doer of the word. And so asking, you know, the Holy Spirit, how can I be a doer of this word? What are you instructing me? What, you know, it tells us that the word of God is like a mirror. And so how many of you know, it's foolish to look in a mirror and not change something. So really, every time we look in the word, it's a mirror. And so something in us needs to change, right? And by his word, we, we, um, it shows us those areas. And then aren't you thankful that the Holy Spirit is there to just not only show us, but then help us accomplish um, what he's wanting us to do. Amen. Um, so I'm going to go over, honestly, just a couple notes here before we get into the message. But really the message the Lord um, laid on my heart for tonight just is kind of ties, intertwines really with this God's God loves you um, series that we've been in, um, but I'm just going to go over a few notes um, from the past couple messages that he's shared with us. Um, so week one, he said this, do I, do I identify with who I am at the core? The value I have to God isn't based on the outside. The old is gone and the new has come. I have a new identity. How many of you are thankful for your identity in Christ, who he's made you to be, right? So that's what we identify with. Um, faith works by God's love for me. How many of you know we just, before this series, we're in a series um, about faith. And how many of you know it's so important because if we, if we don't have a revelation of the love of God for us, our faith is not going to work because it works by love. And how many of you know faith is how we accomplish what we're supposed to do here on the earth, right? So we need our faith working, especially in these last days. How many of you know we need our faith to be working, right? So what does that mean? I have to have a greater revelation of the love of God for me, right? Um, he said this, the reason we struggle is because we don't know the love of God. I can live from the love of God instead of for the love of God. How many of you know that's, a, that's a, the right place to be, right? How many of you know the enemy wants to get us tied up in ourselves? Tied up with thinking about ourselves, right? Um, how many of you know that's where depression originates and stays, is when you're just thinking on yourself? The enemy's soul goal is really to just get us focused on ourselves because he knows if we have ourselves on our mind, we will be trapped, right? So you're not living for the love of God. You're living from the love of God. And then let's just say this. I am the righteousness of God, righteousness of God. in Christ Jesus. So tonight we're going to talk a little bit about in Christ, who you are in Christ, who he's called you, what your identity is. And this is so key for receiving anything from God and knowing who you are. Um, Romans 8, 38 through 39 tells us that nothing can separate us from the love of God. What? A, I mean, we could just talk about that tonight, right? Nothing can separate you from the love of God. 
So it doesn't matter your past. It doesn't matter what thoughts you've had. It doesn't matter. Nothing can separate you from God's love. Um, then I want to go over here. Um, Romans 5, 17. This isn't in, I didn't give these scriptures to these guys, but I want to read this. How many of you, it's good for a little bit of review. <laughs> Romans five seventeen says, for if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive an abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? So aren't you thankful? What does he promise us there? That we have a provision or an abundance of grace, and we've also been given the gift of righteousness. These two things are what cause us to reign in life. And aren't you thankful that it's not just barely, barely grace? But what does he talk about? An abundance of grace. And, you know, the Lord's had me a lot just recently here just about um, not thinking small. And you see all through the word, God is a big God. God's a big God. It's an abundance of grace. The gift of righteousness isn't a small thing. It's a big thing. Okay, so um, those were just a few little notes that um, the Lord just had me on and um, just reviewing as I've, as I've um, gone through my notes. I want to encourage you, when you come to church, it's good to have your Bibles and something to take notes with because how many of you know the Lord speaks to you and then you can go back and look over those things and let him continue to do the work that he's wanting to do, right? Okay, so really tonight what we're going to talk about, like I said, is just who you are in Christ, what your identity is. Um, because I've, I just believe this is something that the enemy attacks so much. Is not, um, it's clouding our eyes with who we are and what we've been given. And um, so let's look at 1 Peter 1, 18 through 19. And this is out of the NIV. It says, For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. So aren't you thankful that you've been redeemed? You've been redeemed. And that it's not something that's perishable. We're faced with a lot of things in life. I mean, what you're looking at, the chairs, the carpet, the person next to you. Everything that you're looking at in this room is perishable. In other words, it, it's going to eventually fade away. It's going to go away. But aren't you thankful that the blood of Christ can never go away? It's an eternal gift. 1 Peter 1, 18 through 19, this is in the NCV. I don't know if they have this translation. It says, you know that in the past you were living in a worthless way, a way passed down from the people who lived before you, but you were saved from that useless life. You were bought, not with something that ruins like gold or silver, but with the precious blood of Christ, who is like a pure and perfect lamb. So this is so key for us understanding our identity and who we are in Christ, is to know that it's not something that's perishable. The blood of Christ, how you've been redeemed, how you've been set in Christ is an eternal thing. You're redeemed not because of your works, not because of good things that you've done, but simply because of the blood of Jesus. So guess what this means? Then if, if you're not redeemed by something like gold or silver or something that's perishable, You've been saved from something that's useless and worthless. Because all of this stuff is eventually going to become, what? Useless and worthless because it goes away. But aren't you thankful that Christ's blood never goes away? That's what you were purchased with. So you're not useless. You're not worthless. And there was only one thing that was able to redeem us, and it was Jesus Christ, the perfect lamb. No sin, no blemish, no fault. 
And how many of you know life is in the blood of Jesus? And Jesus' blood was completely pure. So the Father accepted Jesus' blood as perfect payment for me. I'm going to say that again. The Father accepted Jesus' blood as perfect payment for me. Isn't it awesome to know that Jesus' blood went out ahead of you? Before we were even here, Jesus' blood went out ahead, and it's still speaking, it's still declaring, it's still working for us today. 1 Corinthians 6.20 says, For you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So, let's just think for a second about just the bigness, the greatness, the enormity of the price that he paid for us. The blood of his one and only son. You know, God didn't have to send his son for us, but he chose to because he wanted you. He wanted you. He saw you and he wanted you. And so you were bought with a price. This wasn't something that God was just like, oh, yeah, that's easy. I'll just send my son. And there was no price. There was no sacrifice. How many of you know Jesus was a great price? And a great sacrifice. So, if this is such a great price that he paid, what does that say about your value? I mean, each person in here, you need to say, I'm priceless. I'm valuable. So, we can't shout about how precious the blood is without talking about how valuable what he bought with it is. You're valuable. You're redeemed. You're bought and paid for. So we're going to answer this question tonight. Who are you? The Lord wanted you. He was willing to go to great lengths to get you. Isn't that awesome to think about? It says, it tells us that Jesus would have died for one. So that tells you how great a price for one man, for one person. There's nothing, like, nothing money can buy, no money can buy the price of a soul, the price of a human being. So say that, the Lord wanted me. And you know what, the enemy wants to convince us that you're not that big of a deal. You're not that big of a deal. There's other great people on the earth and my part's insignificant, and I don't matter that much. But Jesus' blood says otherwise. God said otherwise. Um, Psalms 8, 4 through 8, we can go there. Out of the New King James, it says, What is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and the fish in the sea that pass through the paths of the sea. So what do we see here? You're very valuable to God. And you know what? Even the angels say, what is this man? Like, who is mankind? So for an angel who is in heaven around God all the time, for him to notice that there's something different, like, in other words, God doesn't even treat or think about the angels the same way that he thinks about mankind. Otherwise, the angels wouldn't be going, who is, the, who is this? And, and why do you think so highly of them? And why have you set them in this place where you've given them dominion, you've given them authority? It's powerful. So, um, who you think you are or who you don't think you are affects every aspect of your life. So, how many of you know we can have different identities? You know, um, I could ask people in this room, and every person in this room grew up with different parents, grew up in different environments, grew up doing different things. You know, I can speak for myself, like, I grew up in a my parents, you know, brought us to church. They raised us in a godly way. Um, 
I was really like at church every time the doors were open. Um, I played sports in school. I mean, I could give you my life story about stuff. And how many of you know, each of us can identify with certain things with different people, but we all have faced different stuff in life. We've all grown up with different things. You may have had come from a broken home. You may have had words spoken over you that were not what God says. And what does that become? That starts to become your identity. You know, we have three boys, and all three of our boys battle with different things. They're not the same. And for those of you who are parents or grandparents, you can see that in your kids and your grandchildren, that not everyone deals with the same things. Something that can be a battle for someone is not a battle for someone else, but that doesn't mean that that person doesn't battle with identity. Everybody does because the enemy wants to come to take away the thoughts that God has for you and to try to build in you his thoughts for you, which keeps you wrapped up, keeps you not understanding the love that God has for you, I mean, you know, children who are greatly loved act differently than children who aren't loved, right? We we see that in the world. A child who knows how loved they are, how valued they are, they act differently than a child who doesn't. Well, the same is true as children of God. When we understand God's love for us, who he's called us to be, who we are in him, and that that gift that he's given us is not something that can be taken away, we will act differently. We will respond differently. We will live differently. So, um, and this isn't anything like what I'm sharing tonight isn't anything we've not probably ever heard, but I just believe this is what the Lord had me to share and goes along with just the love of God that we've been in and how vital it is for us to know this. So, we can all have different identities, Um, but if your identity is based in anything you can lose, you are in danger, and it's based in the wrong thing. So, for instance, um, I grew up playing basketball, so you know what? My identity for a while was I was a good defensive basketball player, but my identity was also I wasn't very good at offense, so I would hear people say, you suck at offense, Excuse my language, but that's, you know, like they would say stuff like that. So my identity was I'm not that good of an offensive player. But you know what? I was very confident in my defensive ability. So guess where I shined? In defense, right? So all I'm saying is there's different words or different things, you know. Um, I've also, you know, been a mom. I still am a mom. I've been a contractor's wife because Pastor Nate was a painter for a while, right? And then we stepped into pastoring. But how many of you know you can have different identities? In other words, if my identity right now, like currently as Evan Schlegel, is wrapped up in mom of three boys, wife to Pastor Nate, pastor's wife at Beyond Church, but suddenly that changes, it's going to rock my world. If my identity is based in that. Because it's something that can be lost, can be taken away, right? If you're, whatever job you're at, whatever, whatever, careers change. How many of you, your career has changed in the last 15 years? Multiple times. A lot of us raised our hand, right? But if our identity is in that, then we will struggle, Why? Because it's something that can be taken away and lost. So if my identity is based in anything that can be lost, you see this with um, NFL players. You've heard them talk about it before, or really any, like, whatever sports person, whatever sport. But when they're in the NFL, right, and it's like the peak of their career, and they're on TV all the time, and everyone's singing their praises, and they're doing really good, and whatever. And then, you know, they start to get older, (laughs) right? And things just aren't working like the 20-something year olds that are coming out of the draft, right? So they start to decline. And then eventually what happens? They retire. And then what do you see? A lot of them battle with depression. A lot of them battle with anxiety. A lot of them battle with like, I'm, who am I? 
because they, were, they had built their entire life around something that could be lost. Something that could be taken away. So our proper, uh, proper identity and worth affects every area of our lives. The enemy is going to try every avenue and way that he can to establish a bad identity in you and try and, to, and devalue you. If you listen to him and believe what he says, you will see yourself as useless and worthless. Because how many of you know this is where the enemy can get us wrapped up? If he can get you tangled up in your identity being attached to something that you'll lose, something physical, and then that gets taken away, then you know what he begins to tell you? You're not very, you never were good. You never had a, a supply. He can even do it when you're in where you're at, like doing what you're doing. He can just lie to you and say, oh, so and so's better at that. See, you'll never be like them. Whatever those lies are that, oh, it'll never be the way it used to be. Oh, there, see, if you would have done that, it wouldn't be this way. The mind games of trying to get you wrapped up in something tangible. So his whole goal is to get you, your eyes, off of the love of God, really. That's what it is. His goal is to get your attention off of the love of God and onto you. Because he knows that if your attention is on the love of God, on the price that Jesus paid for you, on his blood, on your redemption, on your righteousness... He knows the power that's in that because it cannot be taken away. Um, so we've all heard these words. You're a failure. You're no good. You won't amount to anything. You're useless and worthless. This is why it's so important even to let our words be words even about other people that aren't, you know, and I know like, oh, you're so whatever. Like people, we joke about stuff like that. But this is why like even with joking, it's really not <laughs> okay because it's not what God says about someone. You know, and I love what Pastor Nate says, you know, um, on Sunday where he said sometimes even in parenting or you've heard it before where someone says, shame on you. Never should we say that. Never. Because God is never, and Pastor Nate said this, God is never pointing his finger in someone's face saying, shame on you. Ever. And so if God's not modeling that as our heavenly father, then we shouldn't be modeling it to others. But our problem is when we see God that way. When I see God pointing his finger in my face and saying, Mona, how could you, blah, 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 then I'm going to respond from that. This is why it's so key to understand how God sees us, the price that Jesus paid so I can receive correctly so that I can give correctly. So we are in Christ. Say, I'm in Christ. I'm a child of God. That's who I am. And aren't you thankful that your position in Christ is not fragile? Our position in Christ is not fragile. Seeing who we are and our value causes us to have confidence. So just like I said a, a, a few minutes ago, a child who knows how loved they are, how many of you know they are very confident? <laughs> right? They, they really don't struggle in that area. When they know how loved they are, there's just a boldness and a confidence. And so if I'm struggling in boldness and confidence, I need to look at where am I finding my value I need to look at where is my, where do I see my identity? Because if I am so settled in the love of God, there will be a boldness and a confidence. There won't be fear, you know? Because how many of you have seen a child who knows their love? Like, they'll ask for whatever. They'll do whatever. They'll be bold because they know how loved they are. And so this is how, when we see the love of God correctly... 
And when we're secure in his love, when we're secure in righteousness and how God sees us, we will be bold and we will be confident. And I'm not talking about being prideful, but I am talking about like that healthy boldness and confidence. You know, what does it say? Therefore, come boldly to the throne of grace. Why would it have to tell us to come boldly? Why would it even have to say that? Because the enemy is going to try to keep you from coming. And then secondly, he's going to try to keep you if you are coming, like that we're not coming like. Like there's something about coming, but then there's something about coming like with a smile on my face, like I'm coming. That's how we should be coming to God to receive what we need. Not like, oh, yeah, I did that and remember or I'm just so worthless and I'll never amount to anything, right? But confidently. So don't let the enemy rob you of your sense of worth. We need um, confidence to be and do who and what God's called us to be. So who are you? You're in Christ. You're the righteousness of God. What makes you who you are? What worth are you? Did you know that God said that you're the apple of his eye? Think about that. Do you know that he knows the hairs or lack thereof on your head? (laughs) I mean, just think about this. Like this, it really is amazing. You're not just like a little speck that's just like, oh, I'm just out here trying to, you know, on this huge planet Earth, and I'm just this little low as me, like, no, you're significant. And if you were the only one, God would still have done the same thing he did in sending Jesus. Y'all, we just have to grasp this, truly. He wanted you even when he knew all of the mistakes you would make. He still paid for you and would do and would do and did do whatever it took to get you. So you know what? Maybe you didn't have people in your life or someone rejected you or you've never had people pursue you. But that's a lie because you have. God wanted you and God pursued you with such great lengths that he sent his son to die for you, to redeem you with his blood to put you back into Christ, which is a solid, eternal place that cannot be taken away. So in Christ is something that will never change. In Christ is something that you cannot lose. In Christ is something that can never be taken away from you. That is who you are. So we're just going to look and see who we are in Christ. Okay, just some scriptures. Um, And how many of you have ever heard like, well, I just need a break because I just need to discover my true self. (laughs) Right, like self-reflection and self. Okay, you don't need self-reflection. You need in Christ reality. Like, I don't need to be reflecting on myself. I need to be looking at Jesus, the word, and see where I am in him, what he calls me. Like, self-reflection is not going to get me anywhere good. (laughs) When do we ever find out good things when we search more about, like, who I am in myself? That, like, that just causes you to be like, I really am not a good person, <laughs> you know, right? Like, instead, like, you feel, I just guess in those times, we never come out feeling, like, confident and bold and like, man, I could conquer the world. We're, like, head down, like, ugh, right? But when I go to the Word and I look at who I am in Christ, I come out different. Um. So we need to find out who we are in him, which is something that cannot change. So let's say this together. I am in him, and he is in me. 
Isn't that awesome? You're in him, he's in you, and nothing can separate you from that. Like when you made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, it was a done deal, sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit, never to be separated from God again. Woo, that's exciting. Amen. Okay, Galatians 2.20. So we're just going to roll through some of these scriptures. Um, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So you've been crucified with Christ. So wrong things, your sin, condemnation, guilt, sickness, disease, all of that has been crucified with Christ. Why? So that you can live. But the enemy wants to bring us back under all of that, which then causes us to do what? This life we aren't living to the fullest. Then because we're under the weight that Jesus carried for us that we don't have to carry. Um, Colossians 3, 1 through 4. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting, sitting at the right hand of God. So we'll keep reading, but I, w I just want to stop there. Where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Well, what does Ephesians tell us? That you've been seated next to him in heavenly places, far above all principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, so everyone just close your eyes. No one looking at me. Close your eyes. And I want you to see yourself seated next to him in heavenly places far above. Far above the stuff that's tried to attach itself to you. Far above. And you know what it tells us there? Keep your eyes closed. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. So you know what the things of the earth want to tell you? You're worthless. You'll never mount anything. Life's so tough. You got it horrible. You got the wrong end of the deal. You got whatever. I've made mistakes in my life. How can this ever turn around? Guess where that is at? Earthly. That's earthly. But we're, what, seated far above, sitting at the right hand of God, and we're setting our mind on things above, which is what? What Jesus has done for us. He's paid that price for me. So I'm not down and under. I'm up above. Okay, you can open your eyes. But it's good to do that sometimes. Pastor Nate said sometimes the best thing we can do is just close our eyes. Like when we're struggling with stuff like what we're seeing, just close our eyes. And see yourself seated in that higher up position from that place of next to Christ. So um, it says, set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth, which is what? What do we see? Things on the earth are what? Temporal. In other words, all of this is going to go away. So he's telling us, hey, don't focus on everything that's going to go away. Focus on where I've put you. Focus on what I've given you. So set your mind on things above. For you, you died. And your life is hidden with Christ in God. Isn't that awesome? My life is hidden in Christ with God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Sounds pretty eternal. <laughs> Sounds like something that can't be taken away. 1 Corinthians 1, 30 through 31. But of him, you are what? In Christ. Christ Jesus. Say, I'm in Christ Jesus. So what's amazing is God looks at you and he doesn't see you. He sees Jesus. So how do you think God looks at Jesus? Big smile. That's what you said, Michelle, right? Big smile. God looks at Jesus with a big smile. So guess what? When he looks at each one of us, each one of you, he's looking at you with a smile. Because he sees Jesus. He sees his son. Because where are you? In him. You're in Christ. So if then you were raised with Christ. Um, oh, wait, sorry. 
But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption. So this is quite a promise here, that we have wisdom, we have righteousness, we have sanctification, we have redemption. All of those things are eternal. Yes. Every one of those things are eternal. You're sanctified. You're redeemed. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You have all the wisdom that you need. Do you think Jesus is lacking in wisdom? I don't think so because he was here 30 years but doing his ministry for three years and accomplished everything and was not in a hurry or stressed out. Sounds like he operated in some good wisdom. But guess what? That wisdom has been made available to you. And it's not something that can be taken away. Because it's not earthly. There is earthly wisdom, but that can be taken away. That can end. But God's wisdom for your family, God's wisdom for where you're at right now in life is made available to you. How? In Christ. Say, I have all wisdom. It's been given to me in Christ. We have to start believing this because we have to start talking it. We have to start modeling it. Like when we come up to a situation that I'm not looking at something that can be taken away, but I understand what I'm tapping, I have access to any time. Any time. Okay, 1 Corinthians 6, 11 says this, And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So say this, I'm clean. That's good. You should say that with us. If you all could see some faces sometimes when you're up here. Do you want me to model it? I'm clean. (laughs) Seriously, you should have a camera up here sometime. I'm justified. No. You understand, you're clean. You're justified. You're redeemed. Nothing can hold you. Sin has no hold on you. You've been delivered from the dominion of darkness and transferred to the kingdom of light. His burden is easy and his yoke is light. If I am walking around heavy, I need to check something out. I need to check something out. And I need to say, what's my mind been set on? Where's my mind been set? Okay, so say with a smile, I'm clean. I'm justified. We should be the happiest, most joy-filled bunch. Seriously, who is attracted to (laughs) kids don't go up to people who are or mean or scowly, right? We have been given the greatest gift. So here's what we have to do. We have to quit talking about the sin. We have to quit seeing ourselves that way. Because the enemy will get you wrapped up. I've been there. He will get you wrapped up in what you didn't do, what you should have done, past decisions. Do I have any parents in here where you look back and the enemy wants to get you filled with regret or whatever, junk? That he's trying to hold over your head to keep you bound up. Which is exactly what that does. But you know, when he wants to come with that, you need to say, no, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So, Jesus is great at restoring. Jesus is great at taking dry bones and putting flesh on them. So we should never be without hope. That's what I'm saying. We should never look at a situation and be like, oh, that's hopeless. Mm, can't, he can't do it. Then I don't, 
I don't understand the love of God to the level that I need to. Because he loves me. He loves my family. He loves my church family. He loves the world. He's trying to reach them. And that scripture, we walk by faith and not by sight. And our eyes will get us talked out of what God has done that's a finished work. Because he's getting us to look at natural stuff that we see. Which is why it's very good to just close our eyes. <laughs> close our eyes and get out the promises of God's word and not just think them, but speak them out. Declare them. Because how many of you know he is watching over his word to perform it? But if there's no word coming out of my mouth, what can he, what's he supposed to perform? Okay. Um, let's go to Galatians. Um, actually, yeah, Galatians 3, 26 through 29. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. We could just stop there. You know, sometimes it's good, like, totally our Bible reading and chapter and all that, but I want to encourage you, if you're reading something and something jumps off the page at you, stay there. Like, dig into it. Look at it a little more. Lord, what are you trying to say? Like, if something's alive there, then let him work in you and do it. So, for you are all sons or daughters of God through faith, in Jesus Christ. Aren't you thankful you're a son and a daughter, not because of what you've done? Amen. But it, it tells us right here, through faith in Christ Jesus, you're a son and a daughter. Sounds like a pretty permanent spot. You're a son and a daughter. Through just simply... Believing and speaking and receiving Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into, there it is again, Christ, have put on Christ. So there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Woo! Woo! You're in Christ, and therefore, you're a part of Abraham's seed, which means what? You have access to the promise of God. Every promise of God is yours in Christ Jesus. Every earthly and spiritual blessing has been made available to you. Not because of anything we've done to be perfect but simply because of Jesus. Um, okay, I want to go here. Galatians 4, 1 through 7. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all, but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the father. Even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world, but when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your heart, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. So you're a son or a daughter, you're an heir of God through Christ, you're not a slave, you're not under bondage anymore, you've been adopted in. Thank you, Lord. And you know, I think of the um, prodigal son and that story, and so you had a son, both were in the father's house both were sons of the father one of them did what 
asked for his inheritance, chose to go live crazily, spend all of it. And we talk about that, but we don't often talk about the son who was in the house who, when the other brother came back, was like, why are you throwing a party for him? Like, hey, hello, I've been the good sibling here. And you know what the father told him? You've had it the whole time. So what things have been made available to us the whole time? It's been there the whole time. We just have to access it. And how do we access it? That son did not access it because he didn't believe the father's love for him. Bottom line, if that son truly knew the father's love for him, he would have been accessing the blessings. Okay, Colossians 2, 6 through 10. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. So when are you complete in him? Who said that? Say it louder. Now. You're complete now. Say, I'm complete in him. So you're not complete in him when you finally finish that project. You're not complete in him when you finally make that money. Or whatever. Fill in the blank. You're complete in him right now. So this matters. So the things that matter, the things that count, have already been done in Christ. He and me and I and him. That's what determines forever who I am. I am complete in him, and I am a child of God. And therefore, because of Jesus, I have access to everything that's been made available to me through Jesus. Peace. You need peace? It's made available to you. Joy, fruits of the Spirit, all that. Everything has been made available to you. And you're complete in him. Guess what complete means? There's nothing missing. He didn't complete a work and then go, oh, wait, oops, I forgot to include that. If you're complete, that means it's a full, complete deal. Complete, whole, right? Nothing missing. Nothing lacking. That's right. So if you have that who am I Um, Y'all can stand up, and we're just going to say this. This is um, something we actually, I don't even know if we have any out there or if it's on our, I think it's on our website. It's not on our website. A similar one on there. Okay. So this is one um, I actually have and have kept and keep it on my phone. And this is good for us to be reminded of who you are. Not what other people call you, not what the enemy wants to entangle you with. And I just heard this as I was saying that. There's nothing wrong with you. I heard that. I heard someone say, well, I'm just, there's just something messed up with me. There's nothing wrong with you. Who's telling you that? Who's telling you it's too late? Who's telling you there's something wrong with you? Who's telling you it's too hard? Who's telling you you can't do it? Who's telling you that dream's too big? Who's telling you all that? Because if it's not bringing peace, if it's not bringing joy, you're taking the wrong thought. And you have to have in you your arsenal, in a sense, of who you are in Christ. So that when the enemy comes, you can combat him with words. What do we see Jesus when he was taken out to the wilderness to be tempted? He didn't sit there and go, I'm just not going to look. I'm just not going to look at those kingdoms over there. I'm I'm just going to turn around. I'm just going to bury myself. I'm just going to (laughs) self-reflect. No, he had the word in him, and he combated that lie with truth. The only way to get rid of the lie is not 
to sit and think about the lie, to sit and self-reflect about why you're where you're at. Talk about go deeper. To get up and out, you have to have the weapon of the word, the truth that lifts you up and out. It says he delivered me up and out of a pit. I've been delivered up and out of a pit. Truly, that's one of my testimonies. I've been delivered up and out of a pit. And you know what I said every day? Every day I'm better. Every day he's bringing me up and out of this pit. And I forced myself to not think about myself. I, I started thinking about what I can do to bless someone else, who God has called me to be, what he said about me. Your testimony, how is it? Whatever you may be fighting, it's everything that we're fighting is not natural stuff. It's spiritual. And how do you fight that? We all fight the battles we're facing with one thing, the same thing, the word of God. Knowing who you are in Christ, knowing how much he's loved you, knowing the promises that are in his word for you. There's nothing that he won't do for you. Okay, so let's say these together. Okay, so this is who you are. I am accepted and I belong to Jesus. Can y'all see it or is it really small? If it's not, just we'll just go with it, okay? Um, I am valuable because I was bought with a price and I glorify God in my body and spirit, which are his. I am chosen by God. I am holy and blameless before him. I am God's handiwork. I am precious in his sight. I am his and he is mine. I am God's special treasure. Isn't that good? You know, this isn't just good for our kids to say or for our kids to hear. You're God's special treasure. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I am more than a conqueror through him who loves me. I am a disciple taught of the Lord, and great is my peace and undisturbed composure. I am protected, and no weapon formed against me will prosper. I am surrounded with a shield because I trust in him. Just say that. I trust in him. Say it again. I trust in him. So I've been thinking about this a lot lately. This has been coming out of my mouth. Lord, I trust in you. And I just see myself like falling off a cliff and he's catching me. You talk about trust. You have to really trust someone. And sometimes we think we care more about that situation, more about that person. And we have to just back it up and be like, hang on. You love them more than I love them. I trust you. Like, trust is such a powerful thing. And I'm just, like, a vis visual person, so it just helps me, like, when I see, like, that, that helps me visually to be, like, I am trusting you. So trusting him. Um, where did we leave off? Okay. I am an heir of salvation, and he gives his angels charge over me. So you don't have to be afraid of what's happening in the world. You don't have to be afraid because he's given his angels charge over you. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I am healed by the stripes of Jesus, not because you eat healthy. Now, it's good to eat healthy. I like to eat healthy, too. But I'm just saying, your work or his work? You smoked for 30-something years, and the enemy tells you you can't have healthy lungs. Says who? Either you're healed in Christ or you're not. So we're healed by the stripes of Jesus. I am full of joy, and the joy of the Lord is my strength. Let's say it again. I am full of joy, and the joy of the Lord is my strength. Amen. I am strong in the Lord, and the power of his might. You're not weak. Your body's not getting older and more feeble. You're strong in the Lord and the power of his might. You're well able to do what he's called you to do. You will finish your race with joy. 
strong. Have you ever seen those marathon runners where they're like crawling and like cramping? And I actually have like a very vivid memory because my dad ran marathons when I was younger. And he, I remember actually crying because I was young, but he was like cramping very bad. But at this young age, I didn't know what the heck was wrong with my dad. <laughs> so he was like, ah, like falling over and crawling and over, whatever. So I have that like vivid picture. But that's not how God wants you to come to the finish line. I'm not saying it's not a press, and I'm not saying it's not a fight of faith, but strong and full of joy. And we have to start believing this so that that's the pictures that we see. This is where God has had me. Like, I shared with our staff yesterday in prayer. The Lord asked me, when did you start thinking so small? You know, for healing, for like a little hangnail, we can be like, oh, okay. But like somehow cancer is some big thing that's just God's really got to do something. The stripes on his back were for everything. And he doesn't look at something and go, oh, that's on the class of like, or you need this much a month. Mm, wow. We're like, we classify stuff. He's not classifying. We just have to grab because the enemy wants to limit. He wants to keep you small. He wants to keep you locked up with just thinking this is like you can't break out of this. So it's like I, I told our staff yesterday that verse that says, ex, like, extend the tent pegs. It's in Isaiah. That's what I'm seeing. Like, when did you start thinking so small? And why are you thinking so small? Yeah. Ephesians 3.20, exceedingly abundantly above all we could dare ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. There is a power in you that is not to keep you small and limited. It's expansive. It's growth. It's bigger. So I just pray that even like limits that you've had in your mind with things that you're dealing with, like it's, it's not too big for God and it, he wants to do even greater than that. Where did we leave off? First John 4, 4. Okay. I am full of the spirit and greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I am full of faith and I have the victory. That's a good one. I am filled with the full knowledge of his will. I walk, live, and conduct myself in a way that is fully pleasing to him, and I desire to please him in all things. I am an overcomer. I overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil. Amen. I am led by his spirit. I am called by God, created for his pleasure, his purpose, and his glory. I am royalty, anointed to serve my generation, and appointed for such a time as this. I am in the right place at the right time, doing the right things with the right people. Amen. Can we just lift our hands and give him praise this tonight? I almost said this morning again. Just give him praise. How good and how faithful he is that he, you, you have been seated next to him in heavenly places far above. In Christ. It's a forever seated position. Not, not to be moved. It's not temporal. So you know what? Your job can switch. Your season of life can switch. Things can be rocked, but you don't have to be. Because I'm in Christ. His plan for me has not changed. It's a stable spot. It's a steady spot. It's not tossed around, up and down, up and down. The only time I'm ever tossed around, up and down, up and down, is when I, I don't know who I am. I'm not settled in the love of God and who he's called me to be and where I am in him. Amen. We can be progressing, going higher. We got to see ourselves doing that. Amen. See yourself in him. And when the enemy comes with a lie, you got the arsenals. You can go back and look at this. Every, there's scriptures attached with that. We didn't just like pull that out to something good. This is the word of God to you to fight and to overcome. And to know who you are in Christ.
Because when I know who I am, I can help others see who they are, right? So let's pray. Father, we worship you. We thank you tonight for your word. We just thank you for what you're doing in this body. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for what you're doing in this church family, in this time and in this season to advance, to take ground, to reach this community for you, Father. We thank you just uh, a new way of seeing, a new way of believing tonight of who we are in you, that it's a settled deal, it's unchanging. We thank you for it, that we're precious in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we love you all. Go grab your kiddos. Tell the children's ministry workers thank you for pouring into your kids. We love you, and we'll see you Sunday. Thank you for joining us. We hope you were strengthened and encouraged by the Word of God. If you need prayer, feel free to text us at the number on the screen below. You can also send us an email to info at beyondchurch.org or submit a prayer request form on our website at beyondchurch.org. If you'd like to partner with us in preaching Jesus, you can give securely online through our app or website, or if you prefer to mail your gift, send it to the address shown below. Stay connected with us throughout the week. You can download the app for all of our latest messages and announcements, and be sure and follow us on our socials at Beyond Church. If you've never attended in person, we highly encourage you to plan a visit. You'll never regret prioritizing godly community. We love you and hope to see you soon.